Welcome to Avalon Church. It's Easter Sunday and we're so excited you joined us this morning. Our mission is bringing people wherever they are to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the perfect place for imperfect people. Your next step is your most important step. We are better together. This is church. He is risen. He is alive. He is Jesus. And Jesus, 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 and Jesus is King. Do we have something to celebrate about today, church? We also want to welcome you online that have joined our online community. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. Well, I was thinking about this word control. We like to control things. We like to be in control. Now, some people more than others, but we like control. I mean, how many of you are self-confessed control freaks? Would you raise your hand? I have to raise two hands, all right, because I like to be in control. I like to tell people what to do. I tell my wife all the time. If everybody would do what I say, the world would be a better place. Amen. You agree with me. All right. So uh, not what you want, but what I want, right? Okay. So we like control. But when I think about the word control, we have so very little of it. I mean, we can control our attitude. We can control our actions, but we can never control our outcomes. You ever notice that? I mean, the truth of the matter is we like to be in control, but I believe God sometimes laughs at that. Not that he doesn't want us to plan. I think God wants us to do three things when it comes to that. I think he wants us to plan, plan well. Those of you that are young, graduating from high school, get your education, uh, get a skill, get a job, get a career, plan well, that will help you. Uh, But we need to plan, but we also need to pray. Because the truth of the matter is, we're not really in control of very much. We need to pray, but I think the ultimate thing is this. We must surrender. Because until I surrender my control to God, then I will always be in turmoil in my life. Consider the last year. I couldn't have imagined that anything like this would happen. That has happened, but it did, and we all were surprised by it. We all were shocked by it. Do we send our kids to school? Do they watch online? Do I work from home? Do I have a job? And we were not in control. But once again, God wants me to pray. He wants me to plan, and he wants me to surrender. And when I do that, then God is in control. Isn't it wonderful to know that I don't know what happens tomorrow. I don't know what happens next week, but God does. That's wonderful news. And so when I plan and I pray and I surrender, God gets the glory out of my life. My own life has been an illustration of that in the last nine months. This past July, I went to a funeral in North Carolina, stayed at my mom and dad's house. And uh, when I got back, my back was hurting. I was limping. I didn't know what in the world had happened. I just thought I'd injure my back, had a bad mattress, didn't get a good night's sleep, but it began to get worse. And within a few months, I got to where I could not get out of bed. Literally about 23 out of 24 hours of the day, I would be in bed. And the the elders gave me two months off to try to recover, and two months wasn't enough. I began to plan. Oh, I'm going to get over this very quickly. And I Went to every doctor I could imagine. I went to probably 12 or so doctors. Couldn't get an answer. Finally, went to the Mayo Clinic. Got an answer that what I had was some type of peripheral neuropathy or radiculopathy, radiculopathy, however you pronounce it. I don't know. What happened was I had something that attacked the nerves and the muscles in my back and my legs. And I planned, but it didn't work out as I planned. But then I began to pray. I began to pray that God would help me. And I began to pray that God would get glory. You know what happened? I began to surrender to God. And and when I surrendered, 
People were praying for me. You were praying for me. People all over the world were praying for me. And it was when I began to surrender that God was in control and I began to get better. And, and I went from being in bed 23 hours a day to uh, being in a wheelchair. And I came back and I started preaching in a wheelchair. That's kind of unusual. And then I went from the wheelchair to a walker. And then I went from the walker to a cane. And then I can get around my house without any assistance at all. Oh, I fall occasionally. That's okay. But the fact is, the Bible says a righteous man falleth seven times but riseth yet again. I'm not sure that applies to my situation, but the truth is that's what the Bible said. But it was, it was not until I began to surrender that I really acknowledged that God, did I know that God was in control? Yes. Did I try to take control of the thing myself? Yes, I did. But it was not until I began to surrender that God began to work in my life in a way that I believe God will get glory out of. I'm believing for a full recovery. The doctors told me that it would take a year from July. And uh, so I've got a few more months and I'm getting better and better every week, thank God. But you know, when I think about this, there are many times in my life that I'm not in control. There are many times in your life that you're not in control. It might be a relationship and, and it's not going the way you thought. It might be with your kids. It might be with your job. But I know this, God is in control. And I can plan. God wants me to plan. I can pray. God wants me to pray. But it is not until I surrender that God gets the glory. I'll tell you a little funny story about that illustrates this. Um, I won the Winter Special Olympics in the state of Tennessee in 1987. You don't seem surprised by that. That hurts my feelings, to be honest with you. You're like, oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see how you did won the Winter Special Olympics. It's not what you think. Let me give you a little context and, and tell the story. I've, I told this several years ago, but it's been a long time since I told it. Um, I was 22 years old, and I was youth pastor in Panama City, Florida. And the first big event that we planned was to go on a ski trip. I know it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? So you were probably jealous of that job. I had a great time. Went, uh, took about 50 kids or so, kids and adults, chaperones, uh, to Tennessee from Florida. Now, we went to Obergatlinburg. That's not the ski capital of the world. And, you know, recently, I don't even know if they have skiing there. But I do know this. Uh, it snowed 13 inches the night before we arrived. And so it was awesome. I'd never been skiing before, even though I grew up in North Carolina in the mountains and there are ski resorts all around. I'd never been skiing before. So we took these kids and it was awesome. Um, and because I'd never skied, I went through ski school. And I don't know what they do now. They probably changed it because this was many years ago. But they taught us that if you're going to ski, you point your skis toward each other. That seems the opposite to me of what you should do because I was not very good at it. And they uh, went, went through the ski school, and it was this young college-age girl uh, that was really sparkly, you know, and her attitude was like, hi, everybody, it's so awesome to be here. And I hated her, all right? I, I literally hated her the moment that she began to speak. Well, anyway, I finally went through ski school, and I was hanging out on the bunny slope, and that is the slope that's about, has no more slope than this platform, all right? So, and, uh, so I'm hanging out there, holding onto the rope that pulls you to the top, I was not aware that if, you're, if you fell that you were supposed to let go and you never had so much fun if you're being drug on your belly up the side of a mountain. Well, to make a long story short, um, two boys, teenage boys from our group came and they challenged me. They really kind of challenged my manhood to be honest with you. They're like, would you like to go with us on the ski lift or are you afraid? Now, I don't know if you know this and if you've had children uh, that reach this age, you know, teenage boys are full of the devil. I, I mean, they really, really are. Um, I mean, I think there's Satan and then 16-year-old boys. All right, you know, in fact, Mark Twain said this. He said that when a boy turns 13, you should put him in a barrel and cover it and feed him through a hole. And when he turns 16, plug up the hole, right? So, I mean, we all know that teenage boys have their issues, right? They challenge my manhood. I was 22 years old. What was I supposed to do? So even though I could not even ski on the bunny slope, 
I took their challenge and got on the ski lift. Now, what I was not aware of at the time was this was the most challenging, the highest, the steepest slope in the entire resort. And uh, as we get higher and higher and higher, I began to really be afraid. I saw Gabriel the angel sitting on a tree, and I knew we were going too high. Well, anyway, we got to the top, and the boys left me. One of the reasons they left me because I got my ski bibs hung on the, the, the chair as I was getting off, and I was dangling, and they had to stop the lift and let me off, and it was embarrassing. And uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to get down this challenging slope. And I, I was, I'm a good student. I, I listen. I learn. And they said, point your ski tips this way. And so I did. And I skied like from here to the end of that platform and fell. It took me about 30 minutes to find my skis, and I finally got them back on, and I skied another 10 feet and fell. Another 10 feet, and I would fall. And I had an idea. It was not a good idea, but I had an idea that what I should do is what they do on television and not point my tips toward each other, but point them straight down the hill. I see some of you smiling. I began to ski, and for the first time in my life, I thought, this is awesome. And I began to go down the hill, and I could feel the breeze on my face. And I could feel the breeze turn into a wind. And then I could feel the breeze turn into a tornado, it felt like, because I was screaming down the side of the mountain. Once again, I had no control. I could not go right. I could, could not go left. I could not slow down. I could not stop. Well, I, I take that back. I could crash, and I would stop then. But I was going way too fast. And I, even at 22 years old, I thought, oh, my God. It is going to be a disaster if I fall. And so I did the only thing that I knew to do, which was to scream at people as I was getting closer to them. And they would dive out of the way. Some of them would say choice words to me and give me gestures that I will not repeat in church, all right? So, um, but I began to, I was uh, screaming down the mountain and I had no control. Now I'd been through the planning stage, planned to get there, planned to be awesome, and then I was in the praying stage. Oh, God, please don't let me die. And as I got closer and closer toward the end of this slope, I thought I was going to the lodge, but lo and behold, I saw a race happening. And as I found out later, it was the championship race for the Winter Special Olympics for the state of Tennessee. And they had the little strings with the flags on it, and the, the children were so beautiful and fantastic, and it was wonderful. And I saw as I got closer and closer and faster and faster, I saw the kid that was leading the race, and his family was cheering him on. They were excited because he was going to be a gold medalist at the Winter Special Olympics, and he was leading the race, and he had a smile on his face until I came screaming over the flag and hit this kid and knocked him down. Don't look at me that way. I had no control. But what did happen was interesting because the slightest bump would make me fall down or lose my skis. But miraculously, I have no idea how this happened. I hit this kid and I didn't fall down. He did, but I didn't. And when I hit him, he turned me from this direction to this direction, which was the path to the finish line. And then all of a sudden, I am in first place. And people are cheering for me. You see, I had the full gear on. Nobody could see my face. And they thought that I was winning the race. They thought that I had worked and practiced and, and that my parents had brought me. And, and they thought that I was going to be the gold medalist. And I was. All right, just, I'm just saying, I was. I broke the tape. I finished first. But here's what I know, that I had absolutely no control. You know, there are a lot of times in life that we're like that. We don't plan enough. Or maybe our plan is that we leave God out of it. We don't pray enough and we don't surrender. And I want you to know today that if you are going to have the hope that Easter brings, if you are going to have the hope of salvation, if you are going to have the hope that God blesses your life, if you're going to have the hope that only a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ can have, yeah, you need to plan and you need to pray. But it is not until we surrender that hope really comes alive in our life. And I know this. 
I've seen people that did not have hope. And and maybe there, there are people that in extreme cases, they lose the will to live. But for most of us, we simply lose the will to live well. We give up on our dreams. We give up on the plans that we have. But our main problem is we don't surrender it to God. Well, today I want to give you the hope that Easter brings. Today I want to talk about the hope that Jesus Christ gives us. Yes, his death. Yes, his virgin birth. Yes, the fact that he was the incarnate son of God. But the resurrection wraps it up. And the resurrection is what truly gives us hope. In fact, the apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are guilty of your, still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Think about this. If there is no resurrection, he says, our thoughts, our prayers, our so-called religion is in vain. In fact, he said, we are to be pitied more than anyone else in the world. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Folks, that's the greatest news in the world. Christ has been raised from the dead, he says, and he is, in the, he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. I want to give you just three thoughts today, and we'll be done. How does the resurrection of Christ give us hope? Well, the first point is directed towards skeptics or doubters or people that maybe you just are not sure of Christianity and all of its claims for various reasons. Let me tell you that we have hope. Hope is possible because of the evidence of the resurrection. Aren't you glad if you're a believer that God does not say just have blind faith? You see, once you have faith in Christ and once you begin to develop a relationship with him, you can trust him more and more. And even though you don't understand, you can trust him more and more. But here's the point. God gives us evidence that gives us hope. The Bible says in the Old Testament, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Christianity is a, uh, is a faith that has reason behind it. It is a faith that has evidence behind it. It is a faith that has a solid foundation Let me give you some of the arguments or the evidence that tells us that Jesus really is alive. We'll call this the four E's, his execution. Jesus really did die. You say he was flogged, and I'll tell you this, the Romans were experts at execution. They were experts. Uh, There were three levels of flogging. Jesus was flogged. Uh, The first level was for light offenses, and it was not as severe. The second level was more severe, and it was given to criminals who committed serious crimes. But the third level was the most severe, and anyone that got this level, they had already been sentenced to death. And their capital punishment afterwards was to be, uh, to, to die, to have their life taken from them. Often the victim would die from this type of flogging. This type of flogging often exposed muscles and bones and even organs at times. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, the Greek word for this type of flogging was the most severe. Jesus did not take a light beating. He was flogged uh, in a way that probably should have taken his life. And what we know from this is that medical experts say that when they study this, they believe that Jesus was in hypovolemic shock. That means a great loss of blood. He was barely alive. And the truth is uh, that there are medical experts that have studied this, and they say there is no doubt that Jesus was truly dead. Well, Dr. Alexander Metherell says, Uh, This is an expert who has studied the crucifixion. He said, there's no doubt that Jesus suffered from hypovolemic shock before he was nailed to the cross. The Journal of American Medical Associations states clearly the weight of evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. He either had 
pleural effusion or pericardial, uh, cardial, cardial, I can't say that word, pericardial effusion, which causes fluid buildup around the heart and the lungs. And this symptom often led to the most severe kind of heart attack, which would cause the heart literally to explode. And what we can learn from that is something that you and I should appreciate that Jesus literally died of a broken heart. I believe he had you on his mind when he died. He had me on his mind. The fact is, the reason his heart was broken was not because of the pain, not because of the crucifixion, not because of the flogging, but because the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us. You see, the reason that Jesus was brokenhearted was because he had to become what we are. And he died having taken the sins of the entire world on himself. And it was your sin and my sin, our past sin, our future sin. Even after we become followers of Christ, he died for those sins. And he died in our place. Well, there are some people that argue that because of the resurrection, that it was a, a myth. Myths take normally a few hundred years to develop. The interesting thing about this, though, the evidence shows us that there were very early accounts of the resurrection. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 5, which is the earliest Christian creed that is on record, they have recently dated this creed. They found documents that literally date this creed to within months of when Jesus died. That's incredible. The fact is, there, is er, there, there are early accounts of the resurrection. We see that through scripture. And then there's the empty tomb. All serious scholars, even atheistic scholars, and this may surprise you, even atheistic scholars admit that the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. Jesus was not in the tomb. Why? Because he had resurrected from the grave. And, and I, I love this. Um, the fact is, his enemies would have presented his body if that were not true. But they didn't. You know why? He wasn't there. He got up out of the grave. He resurrected on that third day. And then there are the eyewitnesses. Uh, this may surprise you, but from the, uh, for the resurrection, there are eight New Testament scholars that admit that they saw Jesus alive. Eight of the authors of the New Testament. There are many, many people, I'll tell you in a moment, about the many people that saw Jesus. But what is shocking and amazing is this. There are possibly as many as 21 ancient secular sources that mention the resurrection of Jesus or his followers that believed in the resurrection of Jesus. And if you don't know how incredible this is, uh, all, all, of the ancient histories and the ancient documents that we find, they normally have one source or at the most two sources. And there are most likely 29 total sources that admit that Jesus is alive today. And we have that hope. You see, I would encourage you to read my blog this week. It'll list all the sources and you can do some more study on it. But this refutes the false arguments that are given about the resurrection of Jesus. There's the swoon theory uh, that says Jesus really wasn't dead. Do you think that a person that lost the majority of their blood was crucified on a cross and had a, steer, a spear rather stabbed through his lungs and into his heart? You really think that person could survive uh, that? Or if he even was uh, alive, that he could survive three days in a tomb? Are you kidding me? The fact is, that's not possible. Some say that the disciples stole the body. Well, the guards were paid to guard the tomb, and they were paid to tell a lie. We have evidence of that. We have the, the, uh, we have the record of that. And by the way, sleeping on duty was punishable by death, by death. And the most interesting thing is that if they were sleeping, how could they have seen somebody steal the body? <laughs> they were asleep. Well, that theory is no good. Uh, some say it was mass hallucinations. There's never been ever 
a record. There were 500 people at one time that saw Jesus after he resurrected. There's never, ever, ever been in the history of the world 500 people that had the same hallucination at the same time about the same thing. That is virtually impossible. And then there are those that say, well, this is a case of mistaken identity. Really? That theory doesn't account for Paul or James, the half-brother of Jesus, the women and the disciples that he appeared to individually and told him to touch him told them to touch him, to touch him. They touched him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They were with him. There's no way that that was a case of mistaken identity. And and by the way, if it was mistaken, why were the Roman soldiers guarding the wrong tomb? Really, are they that inept? Uh, Did the angels go to the wrong tomb? Did Joseph of, of Arimathea forget where his tomb was? I don't think so. So we see that the argument here that that is made, the arguments that are made against the resurrection of Christ are false. They're impossible for them to be true. And by the way, those that say, well, this story was taken from other uh, ancient accounts. Every one of those ancient accounts that they're referring to were, were written after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can say with confidence that you know that Jesus is alive. Who saw Jesus after his resurrection? Mary Magdalene. The other Mary, Salome, Joanna, and another woman. Peter, he appeared to him, and I believe to let him know that he was going to be forgiven. By the way, just a few days later, a few weeks later, Peter was the one that preached at Pentecost with great power. Cleopas and another uh, disciple in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus, they conversed with Jesus. They ate with Jesus, and he opened the scriptures to them. Uh, There were 10 disciples at one time that he appeared to. There were 11 disciples at one time that he appeared to. There were seven disciples at the Sea of Tiberias that he appeared to. There were disciples at a mountain in Galilee that he appeared to. Then he appeared to his brother, his half-brother, James. Why is this significant? Because James was a skeptic. Not only was he a skeptic, he thought Jesus was dangerous and crazy. There are two accounts in the Gospels that tell us that his brothers, his relatives, they thought he was nuts. He doesn't say it using that word, but they literally thought that he was out of his mind, claiming to be the son of God. And do you know that James, even though he was a, a skeptic, even though he was critical of Jesus, After Jesus appeared to him, you know what happened? He became a follower of Christ. And in fact, he wrote the book of James in the New Testament. And he became the pastor of the most influential church that uh, in the beginning of the church, the church at Jerusalem. Jesus appeared to James. He appeared to the 500. He appeared at the ascension. We don't know how many people saw him there. And then lastly, he appeared to the apostle Paul. I can say with confidence That Jesus not only came to life after death, he's still alive today. The Bible tells us that. Well, maybe that was for you. Maybe you came in here with doubts. Maybe you didn't understand. Let, Let me talk to those that have already made the decision to become a follower of Jesus. Hope flourishes because of the power of the resurrection. There is power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest power on earth. It is the greatest act of love that God sent his son, the second person of the Trinity. God became human. God in human form. God in flesh. Can you imagine God in diapers? Can you imagine God as a toddler? Can you imagine God as a 12-year-old boy? Can you imagine God as a 16-year-old boy? I would say he is excluded from uh, the devil that most 16-year-old boys have in them. He was God. He is God. And there's great power in that. The the early believers were Jewish, and they were so convinced of the resurrection that they changed everything. They changed their religious belief system. They changed when they worship from Saturday to Sunday, which is the Jewish Sabbath, but Jesus resurrected on a Sunday. They became, uh, instead of taking Passover, they started taking the Lord's Supper or communion, and they were baptized. They were baptized. Now, why is that significant? Because it represents the death, the burial, 
and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's great power in the resurrection. It has the power to change your life. And then the final thought is this. Hope transforms because of the effects of the resurrection. You can have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. Isn't that good news? That, that is news that is the greatest news in the world. The effects of the resurrection are very simple. Jesus saves. And he wants a relationship with you. That is the most transforming power in the universe. And it is available to you and to me today. I'm going to pray in a moment. And I want to invite you both online and those here in the room today to do what others did in the first service today. They received Jesus as their Savior. Maybe today you're not sure. Um, we had someone baptized in the first service that had made a profession of faith as a nine-year-old child. But even though she's been coming to our church for a long time, you know what she said? She said, it was not until I was an adult that I really understood the effects of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that I understood what Christianity was all about, that my hope lies in Jesus. Maybe today you need to be saved. I want to invite you to pray a very simple prayer. And I say simple because... It is simple, but it's incredibly powerful. The Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And by that, it means that we believe in Christ, that we believe what Jesus did. And so today, today I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer along with me. It's really simple. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and that you died on the cross for me to forgive my sins. I believe you resurrected to give me hope of salvation. And I wanna receive you today by faith. And I want to trust you as my savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you, marked, or you prayed that prayer online, I'm gonna ask you to fill out the spiritual survey that's online and indicate for us that you receive Christ today. If you're in the room today and you pray to receive Christ, I'm gonna ask you when I pray in just a moment to let me know and to uh, not only raise your hand, but if, I'm gonna ask everybody to fill out this spiritual survey. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help all of us today to have the hope that Jesus brings to us, to have the hope that the resurrection brings to us. Lord, I pray for every person today that has prayed that simple prayer to receive Christ. God, that they would realize the significance of what they did today and that they would follow you in baptism and becoming a part of your church. And before I finish this prayer, I just want you with a simple raise of hands to indicate to me if you prayed that prayer today to receive Jesus. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to come up and stand on this stage or at the front. We're not going to ask you to do anything but to look up at me. And I want to ask you if you prayed today to receive that uh, most awesome power in the world, Jesus Christ is your Savior, I want you to raise your hand just high enough and long enough for me to see it. Anybody in the room today, I see your hand, thank you. Any others, are there others that would raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? I see your hand, thank you. You can put that down, thank you. Now I want you to listen closely. The Bible tells us that every person other than the thief on the cross, and he didn't really have the opportunity to get baptized, but every person that we have record of in the Bible that got saved, they were baptized. And, and it's very clear, we're gonna have baptism today. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up out of your seat right now. We're gonna give you plenty of time. I want you to get up out of your seat right now and go over toward the restroom exit. There'll be people over there to help you and they'll give you direction. They're close to change into and you can get baptized right now. So if you want to be baptized, you don't have to have been saved today. Maybe you were saved before, but you've not been baptized yet with believer's baptism. I'm going to ask you to get up. Go ahead and get up out of your seat right now. Head toward the exit. Get out of your seat right now. Head toward the exit if you want to be baptized today at the end of the service. Heavenly Father, help us today to receive the hope that Jesus gives. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. I want everybody, if you would, look right here for a moment. I'm going to sit down to rest for a second. Um, I'm going to ask you today to fill out the spiritual survey. We do this every year at Easter, 
and only one time a year do we do this. And it's a very important survey. And it's, it's kind of a small card, so you might have to get out your reading glasses to see it, but it should be clear enough. Um, put your name, your contact information there, and then I want you to check one of five letters. A, I pray to receive Christ today. If you pray to receive Christ today, please, please check that so that we can rejoice with you. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you prayed to receive Christ. Indicate that for us on this spiritual survey. Or you say, Pastor, I did not pray to receive Christ today. However, I'm thinking about it. I'm interested. I want to know more. You would check the letter B. Or if today you came and you said, I've already been saved. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I got saved before uh, today. Then you check the letter C. That would be the letter I'll check. Or D, I'm really not interested at this time. And let me, let me give you a promise. We're not going to hound you. We're not going to mock you. We're not going to chase you. We just want to begin a relationship with you. Maybe you're here today and you say, I'm not interested in that right now. But maybe you are interested in learning more. Maybe you are interested in what Christianity truly is. And even if you are an atheist, do you know that we've had atheists that began to go to this church that checked that letter and they began to develop relationships with people in this church and they became followers of Jesus Christ? It's incredible. And so today, maybe if you're in that category, check the letter D or the letter E, I'm interested in my next step at Avalon Church. Now, why is that important? Because there may be some of you that are interested in knowing how to join this church. Or maybe about how to serve or how to be in a small group. Well, then what we would ask you to do is check the letter E. And then if you're interested in taking your next step here to our church, and that means simply going to the next step class. We're going to offer it in about three weeks, the end of April. We have it the last Sunday of every month. And you can, uh, last week we had, we had a few people that were there in spite of COVID-19 and they joined our church and just beautiful, beautiful uh, what happens there. So we would encourage you to be a part of that. If you're new to Avalon Church, if you're visiting with us today and you've never been here and you've never filled out a card or you've been coming, but you've never filled out a card yet, I would encourage you to fill this out. Now, let me give you a promise. We're not going to show up on your doorstep. We're not going to send anybody to knock on your door while you're having supper or watching a ball game. Uh, what we will do is send you an email, maybe a couple of emails. Um, if you give us your phone number, I will call you. Nobody else, just me. And the reason I do that is because I want to know the people in our church and uh, we don't get to meet everybody. Uh, this is a great way for me to be able to have a conversation with you and learn more about you. If you will, uh, fill out that next step card. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Take this spiritual survey card and we're going to have ushers at both doors. On the way out, drop this in a bucket. Drop your next step card in the bucket on the way out. That will help you stay socially distanced. That will help you um, uh, make sure that you are safe and uh, avoiding contact. And that way we can know what's going on in your life and we can rejoice with you. Amen. Are we glad we came to church today, folks? We've got just a little bit more. Uh, got some exciting things for you, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Once again, if you would like to be baptized today, but you didn't respond yet, if you want to hang out after the service, let us know, and we'll baptize you as well. Um, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless all of our people today. Thank you for everyone here, everyone joining us online, every person that uh, is um, watching, every person that was here in person. God, I pray that you would uh, help us today. I pray that you'd help us as a church to have the hope that the resurrection gives, not just to celebrate it on one day of the year, but to celebrate it every day of our lives. And God, we want you to know that we love you today. We thank you for all that you're doing in our church. We thank you for every guest that's here today. And uh, we want you to know that we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.